He was um, a colonial administrator in India, and straight after the wedding, they went back to live in, in Mumbai, formerly known as Bombay. And they had a son who became very well known in India as a legislator. And the dress is exquisite. It's very, very delicate, crisp silk. Um, it's, woven, it's woven so that um, the flounces can be cut from a length of material, um, which is a special weaving technique. And it was very, very stylish um, for its period. It was quite similar to the wedding dress worn by the Empress Eugenie, the French Empress, who um, was a great fashion icon in Britain, much admired by many women, including Queen Victoria. When Queen Victoria um, visited France uh, to visit the Empress Eugenie and her husband, she kept a diary. And in her diary every day, she wrote what she had been wearing and what the Empress had been wearing. <laughs> And on the whole, I think the Empress's clothes came out tops, but definitely Queen Victoria's jewellery was superior. <laughs> and by that stage, it had been enhanced by some very splendid jewels from the East India Company. So it's quite, quite amusing. Um, but uh, Eugenie wore um, a flounce skirt like this and a bodice with a basque. And um, Margaret Scott Lang ordered this dress with a, an evening bodice so that she could, it, was, it made the outfit more versatile, so she could either wear it with the bodice for day, daytime wear, or wear the, so she could wear the skirt with the bodice for daytime, or the skirt with the evening bodice for an evening event. And that versatility is very important in the Victorian period. On the right is a dress worn by Lucretia Crouch uh, for her marriage to Benjamin Seabohm at the Friends Meeting House in Clevedon, which is in the west of England, quite near Bristol, on the 10th of September, 1874. Now, we were, all the information we had about this was that it had been worn by, at a marriage of the Seabone family in the mid-1870s, and it took me hours to find this wedding, hours and hours, and I was so pleased when I did. Um, and I discovered um, a local history lecture that somebody <coughs> had given um, about Benjamin Seabone. And he was a bank manager in the family bank. Uh, many Quakers worked in banking and he was a widower with a young daughter. Now, um, the dress is not particularly fashionable. It was, it was, this dress was mainstream fashion for 1874, and that was very much how many Quakers dressed in Britain. It was very high-quality fabric, um, but it wasn't the height of fashion. And the idea was to, you didn't, if you dressed in mainstream fashion, you didn't draw attention to yourself, uh, as you would if you either wore rather clothes that were too old-fashioned or clothes that were too high fashion. But the intriguing question, which I don't know the answer to, is did she wear a bonnet? In, 1870, in 1867, a Quaker bride's decision to wear a veil rather than a bonnet and her decision to have an entourage of bridesmaids was reported in the local Bristol press. And then it spread. And when you read 19th century newspapers, you can see it spreading. So it went from the local press to national press. That, and then it inspired a satirical poem in the magazine Punch. And Punch contrasted her worldliness with the sobriety of previous generations. And the point of the satire was that even members of strict nonconformist sects, like the Quakers, were now copying the practices of society weddings. And it was another instance of that commercialization of the wedding. Now, I'm, I'm very interested by menswear, and it often it gets short shrift, really, in many fashion exhibitions. Um, but I was determined not to go down the line of this was, uh, this was the type of garment worn by a bridegroom. I wanted to find real garments worn by bridegrooms. And fortunately, I discovered that the V&A had a particularly nice group of mid-19th century uh, waistcoats and shirts. So they were wedding waistcoats and wedding shirts worn by men. And I knew their wedding waistcoats or wedding shirts because of the letters that had been sent with them, because of labels stitched to them, and little notes that had been found in waistcoat pockets. So clearly it was important to the families who donated these objects that you know, their history was preserved. Now, publications about men's fashions don't suggest that any special clothes should be worn for weddings. The etiquette was to wear formal day wear, and unless the bridegroom was serving in the military, or like Prince Albert had mil military rank when a dress uniform could be worn. However, men's outfitters, who supplied middle-class men with ready-made and custom-made clothes, advertised wedding waistcoats and wedding suits. 
in the classified ad advertisement columns in newspapers. And when I came to look more closely at our collection, it seemed that sentiment also played a role in, the, in some bridegroom's choice. Um, so on the uh, right, there's a very attractive white satin waistcoat embroidered with lily of the valley for purity of heart and forget-me-nots for true love. Um, and on the left is a wedding waistcoat worn by John Montefiore, which was presented to, his, uh, to the V&A by his three unmarried daughters, um, together with two waistcoats embroidered with forget-me-nots. And the waistcoats embroidered with forget-me-nots told us they had little no notes stitched to them, saying that the embroidery had been done by Julia Palmer. And it was only when I'd done the track him down on the census that I realised that Julia was his wife. We weren't told, given that information in any of the correspondence. Um, and I think that these were waistcoats made um, to wear on the wedding night, um, because couples often change their clothes after the wedding for their um, wed wedding reception, what we would call the wedding reception. Um, we had very little menswear for the 20th century, but uh, we managed to um, acquire, some, acquire and borrow garments. There's a great 1970s um, suit made by the designer tailor Mr. Fish, um, and we borrowed a kilt for the late 20th century section, which I worked no, later than that, early 21st century, because I felt a kilt was essential for any exhibition about British wedding dress. So having established roughly what I wanted to include, I needed a skeleton to provide a scru structure, and I decided that a chronological approach would be most appropriate. So one of my thorny problems was the early 19th century. We, did, we had, actually, we do have quite a number of early 19th century wedding dresses, but they were either in shocking condition, um, I mean, too, too poor condition to be conserved, or else they'd been altered for fancy dress later um, in the century, and therefore they were misleading. And I, didn't, I wanted to really, I wanted to keep a focus on fashion because bridal wear was really fashion-led in, in the 19th century. But um, we were very lucky because um, the wedding dress on the screen came up for sale um, and I persuaded my head of department to let me try and buy it. And when I went to look at the wedding dress, I was presented with a wedding dress with um, short sleeves like the picture in the middle on the screen. And um, the, the catalogue for the auction had a nice image of Eliza Larkin who wore it, which is also on the screen. So I knew... I, learned that it had come from the family, from the auctioneer, and there was quite a lot of family history to go with it. Um, so that was good, if it had provenance. But I, I, I knew from the auction catalogue, and I double-checked this, that she married in church. So I concluded that she must have worn a coat over her dress, because a bride would not marry in church in a short-sleeved dress in 1828. Um, so we purchased a dress, and everybody was very excited about it. And then um, a month, about a month after I, we'd purchased it, um, I was put in touch with the vendor, and it turned out to be the current uh, Lady Monson, because uh, this Eliza married um, William, who became the sixth Baron Monson. So the Monson still live in Lincolnshire, and she had discovered the wedding dress in the trunk in the attic. But a month after she was thrilled the V&A had bought it, a month after she was looking through a, a chest of drawers, and she came across the sleeves for the wedding dress. <laughs> so Eliza had ordered this wedding dress with a pair of detachable sleeves, and they are so beautifully made and fit so perfectly that they only require one hook and eye under the arm to keep them in place. And we will be displaying the dress in the exhibition with its sleeves on and with the little shawl. But in the book, we've included the image of the dress without its sleeves. Um, so that was fantastic, terribly exciting. Um, then a month later, about, she rang me again and said, you'll never guess what I found now. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so she had actually found the wedding headdress, which is extraordinarily rare. 